almost, I hear. Well, that's a very good sign that you're still talking because it means that you are connected. So if you want to know more about uh, Emerson Olier, then it may be nice, maybe better to, uh, uh, to also listen a little bit to me. If not, feel free to, uh, to do other things. Um, so first of all, we heard about Emerson Prairie and, and Metsumas this morning. And um, we showed examples of how to use it on the example data. If you want to try it out in your group data, that's possible. However, uh, please use the notebook in the solutions folder because there's an additional step needed to match all the feature IDs between your data, the group data, and the results of MSP Prairie. So otherwise, I will get an error. Um, we try on try to fix it. Let us know if it doesn't work yet, and throw your arms around, you're around till tomorrow. All right. Um, another question I have. So um, I put in the GitHub a lot of information and links out the various data for the groups and the example data. However, oh, you see yesterday, the day before yesterday, oh, yesterday, how easy it is to kill a server if you all try. Yeah, but like 50 or 60 people to start a job. Well, I can tell you the MSOLA web server is way less fancy than the super cluster in San Diego. <laughs> so it doesn't take a lot of you to kill it. So my time request is to not all go there now, because then everything will freeze and even a live demo will not work. All right. So just listen to me. I will show you a few things and then at your own time. At your own uh, tempo, you can go there, and the server can also hopefully handle all your uh, Skype requests. Then, all right. So, um, if you know me a little bit, you know that I like to take pictures of various things, including uh, the sky. And this is a, a sunset right in front of my window in Wageningen. And actually, I wanted to use it as a start to the lecture. On MSLDA. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, I made a, a highlight. Still working? Yeah. yeah. So I made a, an, a, an, a picture, an enlargement of the picture. And my question to you is what do you see? And there's no wrong answer. That is the, the nice thing, right? Clouds. Clouds, okay. <laughs> Good. Hmm? Eagle. Eagle? All right, I didn't see the eagle yet. Yeah? Uh, good. More? Hippo. And hippo. Yeah? All right. Not sure what Robin had for, for the for the top of brain. <laughs> All right. So what I saw was a man with a good start. With two eyes and nose and a huge good start. Yeah? So now you all see it probably. All right. Um so but this is like pattern recognition, right? Our humans with our eyes, they are really good in pattern recognition. Um, well, you, you have doubts, but I bet you can see the difference between a lion and a, and a, and a bird, let's say, and then assess whether or not you have to run away. Yeah, that, that's what they say where it came from. Anyway, pattern recognition is actually also what Emma is doing. Um, but uh, obviously, not with our eyes, but then using a computer. And well, we have to walk here to, to make it work. Yeah. So this is another picture. And um, I think some of you already know, I've been here during my studies. I did my internship in Copenhagen. So I lived here, and this was the opposite of the street where I live uh, in the Nurburg Hall. And yeah, basically, I'm going to ask you again, what do you see? Window? Face. Hmm? Faces. Faces? Okay. Windows. Apartments. All right. I was actually looking for a very simple answer, right? <laughs> and why is that? Well, because everywhere in the world, yeah, we will recognize it. Why? Because there's, there's windows, there's some structures to it that we all recognize as houses, right? So, and um, so actually, we're using some common concepts with humans to build apartments. And the analogy with nature is nature also uses common things, common chemistry, common biochemistry, substructures to build up molecules. 
And the idea is then, of course, how can we extract them from the data? Uh, and some cases uh, we can recognize them quite clearly. And in all the cases, like I just showed, it's less clear what it actually is, and we will need to do our best to annotate. So I will not ask you again, but this is a picture that some of you may recognize from earlier talks. Um, and there's a picture I took near San Diego. And, you, and, and with our eyes, we can clearly see there are two groups. Uh, the seals and uh, the, the 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 birds, and um, the idea is that can we can we not use our eyes but use the computer to do the same with them with the spectra, recognize the grouping that is implicitly there, propagate that information, and annotate uh, uh, these chemistries. And we've seen examples of how uh, molecular networking is doing that. And now we're going to discuss substructure discovery. And I already showed you the analogy between spectra and text. If you remember the, the example of uh, coffee and, and cookies and uh, cake and cappuccino from uh, earlier today. And also I'm still the A uses that analogy. So we have different parts of the text here with different words, different colors. And each color represents uh, a group of words which is often co-occurring let's say, in a large body of text. You have to imagine we have like thousands of documents, and then the algorithm, the LDA algorithm, tries to look for what is commonly always co-occurring. And in red, we see words like plate, and united, professional, etc. And in blue, we see words like funding, and predators, and in green, renewable energy, etc. So the analogy with the spectra is that each word becomes a, a pink, or a neutral lot, and each text document becomes a spectrum. And you can imagine in, in, in our data of, of during this week, with more than 6,000 spectra, so 6,000 of those things with all these uh, uh, peaks, and then the algorithm will try to find groups of common, uh, commonly co-occurring peaks. And um, the nice properties of the, of the text mining, in this case, the topic modeling, is that each text can contain one or more topics. So you, you can see the example here. Eh? Document one contains two groups of words, and document two as well. And if you think about molecules, yeah, uh, they sometimes have only one substrate there, but sometimes they have two or three or even more. So that is nice. And also, we can see that the same topic can be present in two documents, right, or even more. And if you think about substrates and molecules, yeah, of course, yeah, we, we, we see that. We see the same. Substrate is used again and again and again, as I just told when, when we were discussing, like at the common building block of nature. So, actually, we can actually use that to see if it also works on both spectra. One thing I have to tell you is that, that the algorithm itself doesn't annotate anything, right? It just presents you with the groups and it says good luck. Also, in, in the text, so in the text mining, you will need to assign the topics like. Uh, football related, business related, etc. And alike in, in, in the metabolomics uh, data, we will need to annotate. I'll get back to that. So I won't ask you the question anymore if it works because uh, the, the tool is around for a while and, and luckily uh, um, it, it seems to work quite nicely in, in many cases. I tried it out, uh, in, I was in Scotland at the time, in Glasgow during my postdoc. And I, I went to the shop and I bought some Scottish ales and I took 10 ml for science and the rest I tasted. Um, <laughs> and they were all pretty good, I can tell you. Um, and then uh, beer is nice because it contains a really complex mixture of, of three metabolomes, making it a very uh, complex metabolomics mixture. And we can see how MSLDA uh, could extract several biochemical relevant building blocks. So here you see the structures of those building blocks and not, not uh, the patterns themselves. Um, and you can see examples of amino acid related uh, substructures, some aromatic ones, um, some purine, purine related. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, chemical compound classes already represented here. And, yeah. and here we see some examples because I thought that's also nice to go a bit more in depth. So we see an example of, of uh, two 
uh, there's a spectra that MS2A grouped into one motive, one master motive. And we can see that all the peaks in blue yeah, in this, in this uh, figure, they are belonging to the motive and uh, all the other peaks not. And here we can see that uh, yeah, there's quite a few intense peaks that, that MS2A grouped as always being together or quite often being together. And with my own background in natural product chemistry, tomato, uh, I am a tea and tomato in, in Wageningen, do my PhD, uh, I, I, I could immediately see, ah, that is ferulic acid related. So I went I went on and I looked in literature if that made sense to see that in beer. And yeah, it, it, it could well be. So uh, then I could annotate this particular master motive as ferulic acid uh, related. And we could actually detect it in only 11 out of the 1,000 spectra. Why I'm saying this is that, you know, you, you, you get a sense of how specific or sensitive a motive is or can be. And for the paper, uh, we also validated the tool with standards. I think uh, we've seen some validation before when I discussed uh, briefly uh, Amazon Query. So, and this is maybe also a nice moment to say that back then we had access to 5,000 spectra from DMPS and 2,000 from Westbank. And uh, nowadays there's more than 500,000 spectra in uh, DMPS and the Westbank numbers I don't know by heart. So you can see that in, in the last seven years, um, the amount of available spectra has been uh, yeah, uh, increased by a factor of 100. So by the way, it's spectra that I'm saying and not unique molecules. I think we are now at 23,000 23, unique molecules in GMPS. And I'm looking at all of you to increase that, okay, to, uh, to more. Um, then using the, the 5,000 uh, molecules from GMPS, um, we've, we started to validate it. So we run the tool and, and then I assessed all the motives that came out, all the patterns. And as we can see here, these are three molecules right? because it's a fragmentation uh, library. So we know the structures and the spectra. And I think by now you have probably seen the common denominator in the three molecules. And but you also see that the spectra are not that much alike, I think. Uh, they do share common features, but they're clearly not the same. Uh, and that's also something that is nice uh, when this uh, when, when you use MSTLDA. The, I mean, it doesn't need to be exactly the same pattern. Um, it does allow for some fluctuation and flexibility in there. So it's this anonym part that is common if you haven't seen it yet. And it's the red peaks that, that kind of are representative for it. And actually this is also the first master motive that I saw uh, with one of the first results uh, that, that, that we got from, from the first attempt with Simon Rogers and uh, Joe Wandy back in 2015. And it was also from a beer file. And then I, I, I spotted this anonym related uh, um, master motive. And then I thought, okay, could work. And then it still took like two years to, to get it to really work like, like it is now. But at least uh, it, it, it's one of the first motives that I, that I could uh, immediately by eye validate. And the nice thing is we have multiple motives uh, uh, per spectrum. So we have a green loss here, and that is actually connected to the to the sugar bit of adenosine in the middle. So that molecule adenosine is actually completely decomposed by MSTLDA in two substructures. And you can also see that that part can also be found in other molecules. Yeah? So connecting molecules in different ways. So uh, a few years after the, the, the publication in PLAS on the, on the topic modeling approach, with Joe Bundy, uh, we built this msdlda.org, uh, where I kindly ask you still not to go, all of you at the same time. But um, it it is um, it was originally aimed to run msdlda on your LCMSMS file, and then also be able to look at the results. Nowadays, I think what I would do is first run your your thing in GPS, then uh, run GPS msdlda then download the, the dictionary file. And if you want to know more about specific motives, you can go to msdlda.org, upload your dictionary file, and then browse the motives further. And then you will get an overview uh, uh, of your experiment with various options that I will briefly also highlight at the end of the, of the lecture. 
but to get a little bit of an idea, so uh, you can browse through the different motives. Each motive is a speckle pattern found by MSQL V8. And you can actually also annotate these motives yourself. So you can see that in some cases you see text on the screen. That is why I added an annotation to a particular motive. And also um, you can go to the more details of the motives, which peaks, which fragments, which losses were found to commonly occur. Um, at the end of the lecture, I will dive a little bit further into that, but then at least you got an ID now. And another thing is that you can visualize the results. And you've seen molecular networks where we have nodes and edges, nodes representing spectra or features, edges representing uh, similarity, uh, cosine score, modifying cosine score, if above a certain threshold. But here we have, interestingly, we have master motives and we have molecules and we, and we have edges. So actually this is not the network, a network like we've seen before. There's a bipartite network where we have one group of motives, the big or smaller circles, red, orange, and we have the squares, which are all the spectra. And, every, and that is connected when a spectrum is linked to a motive. And what we can already see is that in some cases, some spectra are connected to several motives, two or even more, and in other cases, they're only connected to one. So this visualization could help in, in trying to get an ID, what are the really generic motives found across many spectra, which ones are found in, 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 um, in, in two, which spectra are found in two motives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in other words, it represents an alternative way of looking at the data. <laughs> so then moving on in time, we uh, we also uh, combined uh, MSQL DA with in silico annotation tools, such as Magma. And um, we took the data from the standards. So we know spectrum and we know structure. And we said, okay, um, with large data, okay, we, we worked on this to, to integrate this and uh, to get to some sort of automated annotation uh, when we know uh, the structure and the spectrum, as in the spectral library. And these are examples of what that magma integration returns. So we see that a, a fragment of uh, 136 is correctly assigned to the other uh, uh, part of the substructure of the molecule. And uh, in particular, some losses, uh, like 162, I think many people working with plants or natural products would immediately think of sugar. Um, so that, so that, is, uh, uh, that is quite clear. But the other losses are actually pretty hard sometimes to find. Like what is it exactly what this law 60 is standing for? And this kind of automated annotation really helps there. Humans are better in finding fragments than in losses. Uh, at least that's my experience as a human being. And also what is interesting is that sometimes uh, a loss actually represents different uh, uh, substructures because of course uh, we have isomery in, in mass spectrometry. So even though uh, we now know which atoms are, are in this loss, they can be configured in a different way. And we get an idea from this kind of spectral library based analysis of how many different isomers there, there are. So annotation, is still an issue. I mean, um, if you make the molecules a bit smaller into their substructures, it will come a little bit easier sometimes, but still it would be nice not to reinvent the wheel, right? So we came up with MotiveDB as well, a database of almost detectable uh, most motive substructures. So input uh, uh, to start it up where a lot of spectra from beer, from urine, I will show you in a minute. And then uh, from, the, from the GPS and mass bank, you get a lot of um, uh, motives, and this is a motive for material data set that, that I analyzed. And then with the help of literature and, and expert knowledge, I could assign this particular motive to the lactone ring of this actinomycin D molecule produced by bacteria. And now it's part of this uh, Strepsalini uh, motive set in motive DB. So if you have bacterial data, you know that there are streptomyces sending the spora in, and you add this motive set, and there are actinomycin molecules in there. You are very likely to get that motive assigned to them, and you already know that these are likely to be actinomycin related molecules. So now, next time, uh, we can add the relevant motive sets for each experiment, 
Think about context. We've heard it more often. It doesn't make sense to add URI motives to your um, plant data set, all right? So take the motive sets, take the database that is relevant for the context of your experiment. And then you can still add three motives to, to, to kind of uh, find the not yet discovered chemistry. Yeah? So since there's a focus on clinical applications this week, I also show some examples of, of urine analysis that was also published uh, during my postdoc time. And I analyzed quite some urine LCMSMS data files. And you can see examples of substructures that I could annotate. Um, I will leave it up to you to see if that makes sense to you. But to me, it made uh, uh, quite some things you would expect. But some examples, because uh, this data came from a collaborator who uh, was a clinician and uh, uh, he, he dealt with patients with uh, hypertension. So he was particularly also interested in drug screening capacities. Um, if you're interested in that, there's another paper I think one or two years earlier on, on molecular networking and drug screening in, in the same data set. And this is an example of a motive that I could connect to Lozartan or actually all Sartan based drugs. Um, so that part of the structure is very well visible in, in positive ionization mode. And all these fragments here are present all the time in, in any of these drug uh, metabolites. So again, uh, if you add this to your urine data, you know you can expect some um, drug-based molecules, then in, yeah, you, you, you will probably see if losartan or another sartan drug is present. And then we could also do some comparative analysis to see uh, uh, do we see difference between urines, like in presence, absence of this mode? And another example is here. This is another drug for Repamil. And um, here uh, we actually see that we both uh, uh, have um, fragments, but also losses, right? So actually, in some cases, a neutral loss is also included in the master motor feature set, as it is uh, uh, likely to be commonly seen in uh, yeah in this particular substructure. Then we also have some uh, food-derived uh, molecules, um, uh, sorry, master motives, and, and, and corresponding metabolites. So I could find uh, a motive for uh, protein betaine-related um, structures, and also one for citric acid-related molecules. And I wanted to point out that these are only losses actually. So, uh, so we have a series of losses that is then representative for this kind of uh, uh, structure that you can actually connect to the to the intake of citrus fruit, hence the name citric acid. Um, sometimes, sometimes life is easy, right? Um, and then you can also see that the presence of this motive and the associated met uh, metabolites can be quite uh, different between urines, indicating that some volunteer voluntary patient did have something related to citric acid or citrus fruit uh, uh, consumed prior to sampling and others not. You've seen molecular networking and um, I think it's a great tool. So keep using it. But it does have limitations as most things in life. Um, and uh, that comes when, when we have these two, two clear substructures that both kind of uh, clear peak present, then uh, then if we if we force some grouping, some family formation, then uh, yeah, uh, the two has to choose. Do we put it in, in the one or in the other? And uh, here we have an example of this molecule that contains both acrylic acid and um, the ethylphenol uh, substructure. And in the end, we see that it ends up in only one of the molecular families. However, if we would use small promoters and uh, assign also them, then we can still see that both substances are, are present. And actually, uh, for the example data that you have and the drug that you search, did anyone already look at the spectrum of this drug that you are interested in? No? Who, who did? Did anybody find it? Ah, Robin did. Good. Did anybody try to look for it? Ah, did anybody try to look for it in the molecular network? 
not yet. Oh, maybe uh, maybe it's a good good to see if you can find a family uh, uh, there. But um, yeah, I can spoil the beans a little bit. Yeah, uh, uh, don't search too long for it because you will unlikely find it. And and the reason is that that's another limitation of uh, Moroccan networking is that it's not only the similarity scoring we're using, but also a lot of filtering. For example, the two spectra need to share at least four or even six uh, fragments. But what happens if your molecule only has like one or maybe two uh, clear fragments that, that we can compare? Well, then of course we will not be able to uh, to uh, connect them in the network. And uh, MSLDA doesn't have that restriction. So some motives will be really based on one or maybe 1.1 1 .1, uh, clear fragments or losses. And in that case, we can still group things uh, uh, based on that. We will see that soon. So to get a bit Madeleine, who, who I think will be uh, uh, presenting tomorrow again, and uh, Kiyomin Kang, we then developed Modern Enhancer uh, to uh, combine the results of MSTLDA and, and GPS, molecular networking, to get to kind of chemical details of uh, of molecular families. And I will show you uh, an example of that uh, plant-based study. So uh, we have the molecular network, but all the colors are different chemical classes. So first we could, we could uh, say that, okay, uh, uh, the chemical classification by molecular enhancer made sense. We have all these different uh, plant-related classifications. If you're more interested in molecular enhancer, please feel free to come by later to me or, or tomorrow uh, Madeleine to, to ask questions. And there's more people in the, in the room that I think have used it before. But now I want to focus on, on this MSTLDA integration. And what we can see is that this is a family of, of uh, flavonoids, flavon um, They are really widely abundant in, in, in nature and plants. So uh, not that it's surprising to find them. However, it's one family but now, if we put on the motive information, then we see that uh, the top has uh, blue motives inside, and the bottom has the, the, the light blue purple motives inside. And actually, we can see that this is not like one family. You know, actually, it, it contains two subfamilies of camperol and kirsten related molecules. And during my PhD, I started to analyze tomato data and the first LCMS file that I really went into detail, I think it took me like two or three months to analyze all the spectra I see, okay, is it cursetin related? Is it camphorol related? Is it maricetin related? Ta -di -da -di -da. And now, yeah, running this in, let's say two days, one whole day, the answers are, are right in front of me. So actually, of course, it will take some time to set up the methods to kind of get to know them, get a feeling for what they're doing, but in, then they will very likely uh, save you a lot of time uh, um, and, and you will not spend like months uh, on, on the analysis of one file only, uh, one. So typically uh, nowadays we run 50 or 100 or 200 files. So another example is this three terpenoid family where we can actually uh, see that different Organic, uh, organic acid molecules are, are conjugated to this uh, three terpenoid backbone, uh, protocategory acid, phenylic acid, comoric acid, and you get a really quick overview of, of their present and occurrence in, in this molecular family. So, all very nice, yeah, but how do, we, how do we use it? So I already said, I would definitely recommend to uh, to use the GPS based uh, workflow um, because yeah, once because everything will already be integrated and you don't need to do a lot of additional steps to make it all work together. And two, because there's a button right uh, analyze with MSTLDA. So you push the button and you arrive at the workflow and all the files that you need are already there. Yeah, so that is the good news. And this is actually the job that uh, Scott run for the for the summer school, example data. And then you end up here. So you get your reanalysis of this particular job ID of what you run before. And then um, all the files you need are, are already um, uh, in, yeah, correctly placed here. 
So, but what we still need to do is uh, um, kind of define what kind of settings we need. And that is something that I wanted to make sure that you at least get, a, get an idea of how to approach that. Um, so, well, first of all, this is what you see uh, in, in the part with the setting. So you see that at the motive to be selection, all the motive sets that are present here are by default included and the other fields are not shown yet. So let's, let us start by um, kind of making sure that we see everything and then we start uh, above and then we uh, um, move uh, downward. So, well, first of all, this advanced MS2 there parameters um, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I wouldn't call them advanced, but basic MS2 array parameters, but okay, that's a, a different story. Um, make sure that that you know your data. That is basically my 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 main message. Um, so what I typically do uh, is actually, I open the MGF file and I just look at spectra. So that's also what I did for, for the summer school sample data. I opened it to see, Okay, uh, we have uh, fragments, we have intensities. How high are they? I mean, can I see the, the noise level in this MDF file? Because it's this MDF file coming out of the feature-based molecular network that we put into the tool, right? And there's one thing to understand, the more features we put in, the longer it will take, and the more you have to analyze. So there's a balance there. Of course, you can squeeze out a lot, and then there's nothing or hardly anything to analyze. But um, if you input a lot of noise, it will it will just you know uh, unnecessarily delay your uh, your your outcomes. So based on that, then I assign the noise level, and that will be different for all of you. So uh, uh, for this particular example, I chose a setting. But yeah, my main message is go there and look. Eighty to ninety percent of the errors and drops that I get contacted about is because people wiped out all the fragments in the data. So then they end up with this, with, with an empty file that they that they feed into the tool and then the tool is not happy. Yeah. So and then they said yeah they contact me and I said yeah well maybe check your minimum uh noise level setting. Yeah. So the settings here are default but they, they, they don't mean that they're good for your data set. Yeah in, th in this case they're default for an LCMS MS data file run on a few executives um etc cetera, etc cetera. and maybe your data is from the top <laughs> and maybe you don't want to have a very accurate bin width so i heard before that some people yeah uh, uh, weren't really familiar with the concept of binning but binning means that if you have all the fragments you can see them here yeah how do we know if this fragment here 231 1224 is the same as the two two hundred thirty one dot one two to five in another spectrum, right? Um, so we have to somehow find a way to do that. And one way to do that, I'm not saying it's the best way, but one way to do that is binning. So simply we start at 100 and then we, we uh, put together all the masks between 100 and 100, let's say dot one. And then all the masks between 100 dot one and 100 dot two. Well, you got the idea now, right? I, I will not continue till 1000. But that's that's what happens in the in 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 the tool, and that is what we call binning. So the more the smaller we put the bin with, the more bins we get, the more features, the longer it will all take. That is the the kind of the uh, the yeah the bottom line. Then the number of iterations. I think you can that one you don't really need to touch. Uh, one thousand has been proven quite okay so far. Minimum intensity I already discussed at length, uh, and the free motives. Yeah, that is that is. Uh, not easy because uh, actually you have to yeah uh, guesstimate how many substructures are in your data and that is of course a very hard job so and but the good news is if you are a little bit above or even 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 a little bit above a little bit above that's okay uh, if you're going mega above then you may get some interesting results and of course if you choose way too little the same thing because things will be put together that that shouldn't be so um, yeah, if you have a large data set to start with 250 or 303 motives and add the relevant motive to be um, kind of annotated motive sets is a good starting point, I think. Then uh, the, the motive sets, I think I already uh, gave it away a little bit with my focus on context, but 
yeah, by default, they're all included, but don't, don't do that. I mean, uh, really assess which ones are relevant for your uh, data set, okay? If you have like a urine data set, you may want to include GPS, a mass bank, and urine, yeah? Uh, if you have a, post an, a positive mode a data set in plants, then you may want to include GPS and mass bank, but, but not the others. Um, here, I'm not a robot, but... Um, what happened? Are we back? Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, for example, the, the remnant CI plant, uh, the motive set is in negative mode. Yeah. So if you have positive mode data, it doesn't make sense to include that one. So, et cetera, et cetera. So check what makes sense, include those to help you on the way. And then um, there are more motive sets on, in the, on the motive to be website. And you can then uh, if choose to add them as well. But I would I would recommend not to start immediately with that. And then these are the advanced parameters for the output, the combined output of GPS, molecular networking, and MSLDA. And if you just start with it, just leave it at the default value. All right, that's okay. So this is what I came up with for our data set. So uh, I chose bin width of 0.01 to kind of not unnecessarily uh, uh, make the analysis too long. Uh, the minimum intensity of 1000 and the free mode is 150. Uh, uh, it's just a, a starting point. Also because we do include in total 200 motives from motive to B, which is already quite a lot, yeah? And then, um, the results look like this. When when it finished, this one took like four and uh, nearly five hours on the supercluster in 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 uh, uh, San Diego, um, and it gives you a number of things to look at. So I'm not going to go in detail about all of that today, but we can look at the view pairs with the motive axis. That is um, the third one uh, uh, on the right hand side uh, at the top. And then uh, we see actually um, the cluster ID, the feature ID, another feature ID where it is connected to, and then the type of interaction. And we can see now that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, motive. We have coaching based interactions, which you know from the modern networking, but now we have also motive based interactions. And we can see that some motives only have a number. And other have like a GPS motive, your motive. And as you may have already guessed, the ones with, with a name and number, they come from motive DP. The one with only a number are the three motives that, that are included, right? Then uh, we can also look at individual motive details. And there for each spectrum, for each feature ID, uh, there's a, uh, there are listed here. But you can see that some of them are also present more than one. And that means that they have more than one motive assigned. Yeah? Um, and then we see that uh, for all the um, motive sets for motive DB, there's a direct link to the motive in motive DB. So you can check it out and see if you agree with it or not. And also the annotation is there. So we can actually, you can actually already search if you are particularly interested in in the search search that you know is your motive DB, then you can put it, the text in the search field and you can search for it. I did that because I was interested to see, do we have any diphenyl related um, spectra in, in the data? Because the drug that we are interested in has a very yeah, clear diphenyl uh, substructure. And actually we can see that 13 of all the more than 6,000 spectra have this diphenyl substructure associated with um, uh, it, with in, in motive DB. So um, then I went to look at all the recursion markers and I, I read the paper or I checked the paper and the results and I compared the masters. And actually uh, I was uh, happy to see that many of the masters here were actually also discussed in the paper. It means that somehow uh, using an annotated 
uh, motive from motive DB, uh, I could actually pull out a lot of drug related features. There were some masters not mentioned in the, in the paper. And what I did, and that is also interesting because you heard about MAST from Ming uh, yesterday. So I thought, okay, um, let me see if this is a biological signal or, oh, let me see if this is a biological signal or, uh, or something real. And uh, so I searched for this spectra in MAST in all, in all the data and actually, um, only this data set that we use came back. So that, that means that it's very likely to be noise or, or maybe a co-fragmentation with a real metabolite or, well, not something biological, I would say. So in the end, I could, I could see that most features here in this list are indeed drug related. And some of them are uh, isotel isotopes or probably co eluted masses with real drug metabolites. So, Another thing, what is nice, is that um, you can directly download the um, you can directly download the cytotrace file just to get an ID or sorry view uh, in in the browser to get an ID of uh, whether motives are actually assigned. I would actually only use it for that, and I wouldn't download this cytotrace file. Why? Because um, uh, if you if you just download uh, directly from GMPS, like from the regular way, you get a bit more freedom in how you color the, the, the edges and how you uh, define the nodes, or at least uh, it, it was easier for me to get it to work. But this is a good first screen where to see any, yeah, if anything happened, because all the colored lines here are motive interactions, all right? And this is one that I created myself from from the, the, the combined sidescape data that, that uh, basically is, is empowered by more enhancer. And then uh, I think it's nice to show you that you can use for annotation, for grouping, but also to assess whether a monster family is one monster family or maybe a consists of two subparts that we have already seen. And then on the left-hand side here, you actually see that the top features, they, they share all one particular motor, but that is not shared by all the features here. So that that's what, that can you make you wonder whether the connection between 229 and 199 should, uh, uh, should be there or not. And of course, it's all proceeding though. It's all kind of trying to organize a large data set. So some connections will be correct and others will be incorrect. And this is one way of assessing that, right? And on the right hand side, you see that they share a lot of things, including uh, some multiple B motives, so that if you are interested in, in one of those features, then you can also start to look into more detail uh, about that. Um, but what we already also see is that this family consists of the, a lot of the same masses, right? So a lot of the same precursor masses. And yeah, one thing, of course, if your data has a lot of uh, uh, the same molecules fragmented a couple of times, those are also patterns that, that MSTLDA loves, right? Because, you know, it's the same thing fragmented a couple of times, same spectra. So it will immediately jump on it and create a motive for it. Not what you probably are interested in, but it happens. So, of course, the quality of the motives is also dependent on the quality of, of the data. And one way to check that is to see if, if the motive actually consists of different recursion masses or parent masses, right? I mean, if there are different laws around and they all share the same motive, that for me is already a good sign. What's also nice to know is that uh, Ming introduced GPS2.org yesterday and uh, together with Alberto and, 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 uh, and others, uh, the GPS MS2A workflow should be uh, usable in, in uh, GPS2.org. So if you start to switch to the new platform, then uh, ms 2 uh, uh, should be there. And uh, ms 2 Query is being built into as we speak. So I hope that will be available also in the nearby future to use from gmps2.org. So um, in the remaining time, if my laptop allows, um, I will, and ms 2 lvaorg allows me, I will, uh, briefly show you a little bit of how, how to navigate once you have like a data set and you want to know more in detail how the motives look like. 
uh, and which steps to take. And basically, if you upload your uh, LDA dictionary file, so there is one option in the results file that says download MSDLA dictionary. So you download that, you have a .dict file that you upload in msdla.org um, to the upload screen. And then um, uh, the first thing to do once it's finished, because it will take time, it will take maybe an hour, half an hour, depending on how busy the server is and how big your dictionary file is. And then once it's done, you can uh, uh, go to the experiment options and I will show that again. Um, and then uh, you can first set the probability and overlap score thresholds. And why I mentioned that is because uh, by default, they're all very low. And that means that a lot of uh, spectra are connected to, to motives, which is nice, but there's also a lot of false positives. So we want to exclude them. So the probability I typically set at 0 0.1, maybe 0 0.2, depending on, on the data set. You can play with that as well. And the overlap score is something that, that I haven't mentioned yet. So uh, that is also to um, kind of uh, avoid one. So there's one uh, drawback of LDA, the topic modeling, is that each spectrum has to go somewhere. So say that you have one molecule that is very different from everything else. Yeah, of course, it has also a fragmentation spectrum, and it has different uh, fragments than any, everything else then normally you would say, okay, let's forget about it, right? Let's just not put it into a motive. But yeah, LDA has to do it. So typically this ends up in, in a random motive, uh, not sharing a lot of its features with the motive features. So this overlap score, if you put it on 0.3, for example, it will remove all those false positives from, from, the, from the motives. Yeah, and then the rest of these things uh, uh, I will uh, aim to show you uh, uh, by looking into the files. And um, um, this is the final slide, and you already saw it, so I can uh, thank you for your attention. But let's uh, first move to uh, um, stop share. To the right. Okay, um, and then share it again. Hope this works like this. Do we see it on Zoom? Okay. Um, so this is what you arrive in the um, in the. Um, summary page, but let's first go to the website. So this is, if you go to the website, it still works. Thank you guys uh, for cooperating. Uh, so you see this, um, you can register for a login account. Um, however, you don't need it to look at public uh, data and all the results that I made, I made public. So in principle, you should be able to reach them for the different, uh, for the two groups and also for the example data. And then um, here we have experiments. Well, uh, that usually takes some time to uh, open. And then when you would come with your, your, with your GPS data, your dictionary, you go to create experiment. And then rather than create, we go to upload because we already have run it. And then you give a name and the description. I'll leave that up to you. Make it informative for yourself so you later on remember what you actually put in. That's my tip. And then uh, you you include the bidding size here. Yeah. So which bidding used in the MS, in GPS MS LDA. In our case, it was 0 0.01. And then here you choose to file, the dictionary file. And then you push upload. And then it will upload. Well. But it's good to show, right? And that, that's the screen you should get. And then um, the, the dictionary file from GPS MS2 LDA. So I don't do I have it? So here it's uh, download MS2 dictionary, right? So if you download that, the dictionary file is uh, is in in your uh, downloaded folder. All right? Yep. No worries. 
Um, and then you will see it here listed in the pending experiments when it's uploading. So this is obviously a failed one, but it's there. So I can show you that, that, that you see that pending experiments. And here are the ready examples. So if you click on it, you will typically see this, right? So we don't click, it's empty. We click on it, it opens up and it has all these options. And I already told you, the first thing to go to is to this experiment options. And then um, you add a new option. And then we have to be patient a little bit. And then uh, you start with uh, um, with the overlap threshold. You give a number, let's say 0 0.1. And then you add. And then we can go to the overlap threshold. And then we put 0 0.3, for example. Yeah? And then once we did that, it's important. You go back to experiment. It also means that that the kind of new settings will be added on the background, and then uh, once it's reopened, and I think more people are opening the website now. I, I can see that it's taking a bit more time now. Uh, then uh, it will reappear. But that's why I already had it open because once it's loaded in your browser, we yeah we should be good. So um, when we when we will see it again with all the options. Yeah, see, uh, then um, now you will see one. One is called summary page, and that is what I opened here. And this is also the one that you can make public. So uh, if you want to share your experiment with a paper, you can do that here. And then once it's public, uh, you can share the link, and everybody can look at it. But it by default it's private, um, uh, so you can you are the one to look into. So all the things, blah, blah, blah. I just want to highlight, we have all the fragmentation spectra details. So we can see uh, the, the number uh, corresponds to, to what we expected, 6,000 and a bit more, and all the precursion masses. We have the motive details. So we have in total 361 motives, composing of 150 free motives and, and the motives from the motive sets. And here we have all the uh, various uh, features. So they are a bit selective because they have to be in one, at least one master motive with a probability higher than 0.05. So it's not all the features, but it's like those that are more likely to be relevant. Uh, so if you know of a fragment that is important for your research, then you can start to type it in and it may or may not uh, appear, right? So here we have see if you would be interested in the fragment 150 0.350. Yeah, you can see in which motives it's found and also for the loss that, that is also selected uh, uh, for the same value. And here uh, we have all the, the details. So have feature ID, or row ID, the document ID, and then the motive, uh, probability, overlap score, etc. And from this kind of things, you can download a CSP file if, if you wish to do so. So each each of these tables has this, uh, the search option and the um, and the uh, CSP option, sorry. I think we are, yeah. All right, so now I can show you that it's this page. I will not open it again. This this page takes time because it has to read in all of this, all of these things. If you're interested in only the motives as a first thing, then you can also uh, go into the show master motives page. Yeah. Um, what else? So here we can already also look for a die from you, right? And then we see indeed, and that corresponds of, of course with, with the GPS and still the A view that we have uh, 13 spectra associated with this motive. So um, for annotated motives, we still need to check, of course. You need to check whether you think this spectral associations make sense, but at least there is already an annotation and you have an idea that this motive could be relevant. Um, but for so-called free motives, and I opened a random one here, that's not the case. So typically you can look at the fragment, the laws that are found, the probability, it's kind of a mixture between intensity and occurrence of the fragment or loss. So the higher 
the more likely it is well visible and or uh, co-occurring co in a lot of associated spectra. And it goes down and down and down till pretty low values. Another interesting uh, plot is this uh, frequency plot where we have the various fragments and losses, similar as above, the total number of spectra in the motor, and then your occurrence. So this gives you an idea whether or not a pattern is very strong or maybe not so strong as you would hope for. You see that one fragment is present in all the spectra, but then the second one is present in only half. So that, that gives you already an, a sign that, that uh, 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 or this fragment 141 is very unique and special. I can use it to annotate a complete substructure, or maybe you could actually say something about 12 spectra out of the 24. And then here we see all the, uh, the, the precursor masses and parent masses. And as I already told you, you are dependent on the quality of the data. So if, a if, if, if molecules are fragmented a couple of times, then you will see the same precursor masses. And that is also, uh, of course, for, for pattern finding tools like MSLDA, uh, uh, a joy because they will immediately make a pattern out of it. And here we see that in some cases we do have this repetition, but overall we also see some some different motive, uh, different recursion masses. And finally, actually, you can also cycle through each of the spectra and check uh, if you agree with that it's an interesting fragmental pattern or not. Yeah, I mean, I cannot speak for your data, and I also don't have a full knowledge of this data set, but you may be able to do it for a few motives uh, um, now or later if you wish to do so, or for your own data, where you do have the context uh, to see if it makes sense. Um, other motive, and here you see that there's it's also a free motive. You see one fragment, this 62, that's present in slightly more than 20 spectra, and um, they all have a different recursion mass or most. I have no idea what it is, but uh, at least it looks interesting because it's quite a strong and unique fragment. You can see the, for example, here, right? In the red piece here. So, no idea what it is, but I just wanted to point out that, that even though it's only one fragment, it can still be of interest. If it's unique and clearly, abundant, uh, clearly present, then it may be of interest for you. And this is another example, which I would say a bit more uh, kind of uh, strong pattern, where a lot of fragments are present in, in the majority of the spectra of the motive. So that is how I would approach it, to see which motives make sense to, to annotate. Of course, uh, one other way is if you know of interesting uh, parent ions, then you can first search them, see which motives they contain, and then see if you can actually solve those motives, annotate those motives. And then I think I have it opened somewhere, the, the motive for the Dive News. Ah, here I have uh, a uh, motive from uh, motive DB, the loss of uh, carboxylic acid group. And that is you know, present in all the spectra, slightly more than 60, indicating that they contain a free carboxylic acid group group. And when we cycle through the spectra, we see that some of them are really clear, right? They only have one fragmentation peak and the loss and others do have some other uh, fragmentation uh, fragments as well. And then, um, yeah, here we have finally the diphenyl substructure. So we have a fragment of 176. And if you, I encourage you to look at the paper and at, at maybe use Metzimash to check the, the, the plot or in terms of mind to see how the spectrum actually looks like of, of the drug and of the drug metabolites. We see a fragment on the 152, et cetera, et cetera. But the main, eh, because the probability is very high, is, uh, is this fragment on 176. I and mean, when we look at the uh, future frequencies, we see that that is present in all the spectra and then some others are present in, in slightly less than half. Now, then we, here we have all the precursor mass. Again, we see a difference in masses, so that is encouraging. Uh, high probabilities, also very decent overlap scores. And here you can uh, cycle through it. Um, and there we actually see, we already can see 
example spectrum, and you see that this, this peak of 176 is indeed present, very dominant, and we hardly see other things. And that is, of course, very challenging uh, for any um, tools that use a uh, number of fragments as overlap uh, as one way of connecting uh, molecules. Because if we would put it down to one, a minimum of one, then there's a chance that a gigantic hairball will, will uh, exist or, or um, form. And uh, therefore, tools like MSWA can be complementary to molecular network. So you can see, you can cycle through, and you can also do that for your own, uh, own group data. So given time, I suggest that, that uh, uh, I'll round up here. So I thank you a lot for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Don't be shy, it's fine. Yep. Well, to view things, um, so the, the, the main bottleneck is when you, let's say, press on summary page, then it needs to interact a lot with, with with the web server to retrieve the information. But once it's in my browser, as you see now, it reacts very quickly because information is already in my browser. So it's that moment when you would go with the 10 of you and, and at the same time retrieve the information, I think it will die. Uh, but if you do it a little bit spread, like in the coming hour and then tomorrow, then that it will survive. And if one if one person because it, you can still use it also to run it on on a file let's say MGF file or an LCMSMS file, yeah if that runs then of course some of the bandwidth is, is taken up by that computations and then viewing results is also a bit slower. No. Scott. <laughs> Want to be more careful generally in the people, highly aromatic compounds, or should there be some criteria for searching through the spectrum anyway before creating multiple? Or what's your opinion? Well, uh, hard to say for all uh, motives, but um, I have here, uh, so I have here an example of acyl-carnitin related motive. That I, that I annotated myself in this urine data set that I showed in my talk. It has fragment 85 as one of the key fragments and a loss of 161. And actually you see here in, in the frequency that in this particular data set that you're using, that we have like three spectra that have this fragment and two have the loss. And I'm showing this because fragment 85, that particular fragment can also uh, come from a sugar, sugary compound, right? So, um, when, when you have to deal with fragments that, that, that have a lot of different isomeric, subs, isomeric options and that are actually also present at the same time in, in the data, you have to be a bit more careful. Um, but for example, you've seen the example of the diphenyl substructure and I asked the experts and they said that it, it was very druggy in terms of that, you know, we shouldn't expect that too much in nature. So, and there you see that it works, even though we only have one fragment um, yeah, it still can pull out uh, interesting features for you. The same is true for like chlorinated, uh, benzyl, uh, chlorinated, uh, chloro benzyl substructure. It is quite unique and, and also you don't find it too often in nature. So yeah, it's a combination of factors that contribute to how well it will work in practice. More questions? Can you read it out for me? Um, well, um, if you can deconvolute the DIA measurements uh, uh, very well, then in principle, yes. I think the bottleneck is not so much uh, DIA itself, it's more like how we can extract the, the necessary information. Um, we use both fragments and neutral losses because I think the neutral loss do add something to it.
but of course, in, in, yeah, if you don't, if you cannot deconvolute the data well enough, then you end up with spectra that can be, uh, yeah, not clean enough to actually do something with. So, so yeah, I, I would as input use still DBA, um, and I think the modern, uh, the, the most uh, modern bus spectrometers are also pretty fast and and pretty good in, in obtaining a lot of MSMS uh, spectra using DBA. Any more questions? You? Yeah? No? Um, then I have a final question for you. So who of you, after this talk, thinks, hmm, could be of interest for my project? Oh, well, thanks. Mm -hmm. nice to, oh, it's nice to see some hands. And uh, I hope that the others may or may not be convinced by, uh, by neighbors or, or seeing the results of your colleagues here in the workshop. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you again.